Welcome to Online Off Script, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmstead, Online Optimism's New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Social Media Director. This week, we're going to talk about messaging and how it can be used to drive your audience to act. Today, our guest is Haima Moore, Director of the Chairman's Office at the Democratic National Committee. With over a decade of experience in public relations and political communications, Haima Moore recently served on the National Communications Team for the Democratic National Committee prior to taking on his current role of managing the office of DNC Chairman Jamie Harrison. He also served as the Southern Regional Communications Director for the Biden-Harris Campaign, leading teams in Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. Before joining the Biden-Harris campaign, Haimo was the Vice President of External Affairs for Greater New Orleans, Inc., and he also held official city government positions with Mayor LaToya Cantrell and former Mayor Mitch Landrieu. At the start of his career, Haimo learned the fundamentals of public relations from his time at Devaney Communication. Well, thanks for joining us, Haimo. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Mira, for having, having me today. Uh, it's a rainy day in D.C., so I'm wishing I was there with you guys. Oh, yeah. It's very, very hot here. Yeah, it's so. like 90 <laughs> degrees, so I think I'd take the rain. We can swap, swap places. Yeah, either way. Well, well, thanks again. Um, let's just jump right into it. Um, we know you work in politics and, and communications, and so I just wanted to ask you, how important is the role of the press in politics? Yeah, that's a great question. And Sam, sometimes people ask me what I do and I say just communications because politics can be a little, um, uh, you know, divisive sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, So thank you for calling calling me out. (laughs) Um, But (laughs) so one one of the things that, you know, I'll put my like DNC Democratic hat on for a second. You know, what we've noticed over the last four years is Democrats respect the free press, uh, you know, more than the previous uh, Trump party. Uh, and so we are trying to exercise that as we are now in charge of both the Senate, the House and the White House. We're trying to continue to be respectful and appreciative of the press. Um, so I, you know, I have uh, a couple of different opinions around that. So one, the, 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 the free press is so important to the way our country functions and the way we uh, deliver information to uh, individuals on the ground in the states and the cities, constituents. Um, but also, and more importantly, the free press gives the politicians, uh, uh, you know, a, a way to not only get the message out succinctly, but also to be challenged. You know, when you're when you're you look at the White House briefings with the press secretary. Shout out to uh, to, to our current press secretary, Karine Jean Pierre, who's really awesome, uh, and to Jen Psaki, who was who was awesome before her. But they every single day stand in front of all of the press around this country, both local, national, and, and, and some international foreign press as well, to answer the hard questions on behalf of the president, but also to receive feedback from what's happening in Idaho, or what's happening in New Orleans uh, from the press. And, you know, and sometimes you don't really get that perspective until you're asked the question and asked to answer it. Um, and so the, the, the press in some ways is more important than the politician. Uh, because it, like the government and like the, you know, the things that are completely um, standard in people's lives, the press serves as one of those outlets. Um, and so I, I would say so, 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 so important. And we are super appreciative that, that the free press exists and that we live in a country that, you know, we are able to express ourselves uh, freely. So, you know, coming from a social media background myself, the way that we address our audiences is obviously so key. We're always thinking about who our audience is. Um, Is messaging to audiences in politics different than how I might talk to a consumer? Yeah, it it actually really is, Amira. And that's a a really outstanding question because I think sometimes – you know, we have I've, I've worked in PR on, on both sides, you know, working for hotels and and for, you know, tourism organizations like New Orleans and co. Uh, when I worked for Devaney in New Orleans, but also working for, you know, politicians like Hillary Clinton and Mitch Landrieu, whose audiences sometimes overlap. But the 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 idea of how we present a message, you know, look at, you know, there's a I, I get really peed by this sometimes, but um you know, I think Pepsi Cola or one of the, the the big companies, their message now is better together. Uh, in 2016, Hillary Clinton's message was stronger together, and we just did not resonate that as well as the better together for Coca Cola or whatever company it is. And that's because our audiences are different. And when you, th- when you think about, you know, stronger together from a political perspective, that's talking about how people 
lives function day to day, what their value systems are, how they approach, you know, their education for their children, how they approach their health care for themselves and their elderly family members. But when you talk about a consumer marketing, you're talking about, you know, someone's desire for something or someone's need for something. And, and so in politics, while we try to create the need and desire as much as possible, uh, it's just different, you know, and so we have to be very, very uh, nuanced in how we, you know, get that message out. For instance, you know, I was down in Florida um, last week and we were in both Miami and Orlando. Uh, and the way you speak to Puerto Rican Americans about issues, uh, you know, both on the ground in Puerto Rico and in America, is completely different than the way you speak to Venezuelan Americans about issues in Venezuela and issues in America. Um, and so the same thing kind of takes, uh, you know, it, it, it takes into account both the consumer versus the constituent. And so when you sell in a consumer on something, you want them to buy it and purchase it. When you sell in a constituent on something, you want them to believe in it and become it. Um, and so that's kind of the nuance and the difference. Oh, I had a question off of that and now, oh. So I guess my question is, do you think one is more difficult than the other? Do you think it's much harder to get someone to believe in a message than it is to get them to desire a product or you know something from a specific brand. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think it's 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 there's definitely one that's much easier. It's much easier to sell a product to someone. You know, like for instance, you, you look at left the Four Seasons Hotel in New Orleans. Uh, you know, it's been coming online for years and years now. And and once it came online, the selling point was if you want to be included in the new New Orleans, if you want to be included in the, you know, the upscale elite, you know, leisure lifestyle, you know, you come to the Four Seasons, you eat dinner here, you buy drinks here, you stay here. When I when I'm talking about, you know, Joe Biden, you know, you know, build back America, uh, build back better or, or, or talking about uh, Donald Trump, make America great again. Both of those essentially mean the exact same thing, but for different audiences. And so obviously Donald Trump was able to sell that and get a bigger buy-in than we were in some ways to build back, you know, build, you know, build back better. Um, and that's just because like, you know, it, you have to proselytize people in a certain way when you want them to believe in, you know, that type of messaging. And so it's very difficult. You have to go to their church houses. You have to go to their barbershops. You have to go to their grocery stores. You have to go where they are in order for them to actually start believing that you want them to be a part of what you're selling them. Whereas if you're selling Coca-Cola, they can choose to drink Coca-Cola and, and no one ever knows, you know, they don't have to put a Coca-Cola flag, you know, in front of their house or put a Coca-Cola bumper sticker on their, on their Subaru, you know, it's, so, so it's a little different, you know, it's hard to say, you know, come be a part of this movement with me because you'll get, you know, these X, you know, amenities that that's just not the case because we're selling, you know, hope and dreams and, 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 and those sort of things, not Coca-Cola's and hotels. I was just going to say something. I, th I think that's so interesting because, um, if you can get that emotional buy-in from a product and people do put bumper stickers of products on their cars and they do kind of buy in in a way that I think a political campaign would want them to buy in to their to their mission. And so I think that the people that that buy in so firmly with products, you can really tell that that product has affected them some way. I mean, people put, um, you know, Salt Life, Monster, different types of bumper stickers on the back of their cars, and you know exactly who that person is. And you can kind of identify their persona based on what types of products they like. I don't know if that makes if sense. If Spindrift sent me an entire no. wardrobe, I would be <laughs> fully branded in Spindrift. Exactly. No, I agree. And look, I'm, I'm like a, a, a big Celsius like energy drink guy. So Celsius, mm. if you're listening, please you know, <laughs> bring us some sponsorship. We love Celsius. Uh, but, you know, I think, you, I think you're right. I, I think, you know, the idea here is all about, you know, what's your, what's your, your, your value proposition, what's your, what are your values? And I think for products, sometimes it's a little easier to build a broader coalition of values than it is politics. You know, as a democratic party, we have a huge tent and we're trying to, you know, bring a lot of people along with us and, and really like be inclusive. Um, but that sort of, you know, not only bifurcates our message because it's not just two ways it, it like completely like segments our message and so it's harder to get a like you know a huge array of buy-in 
when you have so many different people you have to talk to at the same time on top of not selling a tangible product. Do you think that the evolution of social media from, because like when Obama became president during his first run, social media was nowhere near what it is. And then, you know, during the 2016 election, even to the 2020 election, like social media really evolved in that span too. Do you think that how social media has affected how we engage as people has impacted how you kind of have to brand and package these campaigns? Yeah, totally. And I, and I think what, what you what you recognize is we think about that. We think about, you know, what that Twitter thread looks like. We think about, you know, what the the real looks like on Instagram. And now we're in tic, we're on TikTok. And, you know, we're, 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 and so for us, it is from I would say personally, it's really awesome that we have additional tools to get to people directly in their houses you know, outside of television, outside of traditional news media and articles. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's been a whole entire game changer, you know, the way, so in some instances, on one instance, it's just overwhelming and we just have way too much access and just too much is going on. But on the other hand, and, and, and I think the bigger and better point is we're able to speak to, uh, you know, a, a 75 year old, you know, woman in Wisconsin at the exact same time we speak to a 19 year old, young man in college in Georgia. Um, and, and that's cool. You know, we have to, back in the day, you know, look at newspapers when they circulate and look at TV, you know, who's watching news at 10 p.m. versus who's watching at noon, who's, who's watching at 4 p.m. And now we don't have to even think about that. We can literally get on our phones or on our computers and send out these messages to a vast array of different types of people at the exact same time. And then also, you know, Mira, you know this because you've done this, it's the feedback loop that's really awesome. Yeah. And so we're able to, instead of doing focus groups and, you know, having, I love being on the ground. Like I said, we were in Florida last week and it was really awesome hearing so many different things, but we're able to get information from on the ground within seconds when we, when we tweet something and not all of it is always factually correct and our, you know, a depiction of how people feel in all of Wisconsin, but it is, it is a sample, you know, and you get to, you get an idea of like how people are responding to your messages based on what their response is to your social media, how many times they share, you know, what do they say under it, who are they, who are they sharing it to, when they share it. All of these different things have just been a really great asset for political parties and campaigns. And I think we are leaning into it, um, really leaning into it now, much different, like you said, than 08 and, and 09. And I think Obama, you know, really kind of had the blueprint on how to engage that way in that way. But you're seeing Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, who is, you know, in his mid 80s, you know, on social media every single day. You know, you wouldn't have, you know, this is unfathomable in some ways. I totally agree. And one thing that I find really interesting is that because we can talk to people more directly and with more nuance and more explanations of whether it's policies or positions or anything like that, I wonder if old school taglines are as important as they used to be. Build back better, um, you know, stronger together, make America great again. Do we still need all of these taglines that may not say everything we want them to say when we can dive way, way deeper in a 30 second TikTok clip than a three word tagline? Yeah. I, I think I think you need both. Um, I think that's the reality. You need both. And what what we're seeing on the ground is if we when we focus too much on one, we miss the other. There's still a vast amount of people who are yard sign, you know, yard sign Democrats, yard sign Republicans who you know who really really buy into having that value signal in front of their yard or you know being able to take the the gift or whatever you know the meme or whatever we're trying to push out to just show that they are part of that messaging or, or whatever it is we're trying to sell. Um, and so I think it's important to do both. I, I, you know, you look at Hillary Clinton in 2016, there were several different uh, iterations of, uh, of, of Stronger Together that we that we went through breaking down barriers. You know, I'm with her, you know, Stronger Together, um, you know, that was a, a fighting for us. You know, that was a, we, we went through a lot of different, you know, different iterations of that. Just to, and, it, and, it, and it all signaled two things. We wanted to say, Hillary Clinton is your candidate and she's going to do what she's got to do to make sure you get what you need. Uh, one. And then secondly, you know, giving people a, a, an avenue to say that they are a part of that, you know, that movement, you know, and look at what Bernie Sanders was able to do in 2016 and even in 2020, you know, he, 
is the epitome of who of, of being good at both. And he, you know, had New York sign, you know, Democrats, but he also had the Twitterati, you know, Twitterati and all these other folk on social media who were like, you know, really pushing his message forward in a really authentic, beautiful way. Um, and so, so yeah, you need both. And, and I think Bernie is going to, is going to be a blueprint for us to follow even local candidates to follow you know, see Gary Chambers in Louisiana, you know, Gary's doing such a great job of doing both as well. Right now, Gary Chambers has a really great persona on social media, but he also has that old school sort of you can take him to church and get, you know, the church mothers to buy into him as well type of uh, persona. You know, I I think about how I originally was thinking that these slogans are a bit more dated and people these days want to know a lot because we have such a huge information loop on the Internet. But at the same time, we know that Gen Z has very short attention spans. And then when you give them the quick and dirty of what you're about, like that's what's going to stick. So I, I, you know, I guess that that pretty much leads right into our next question. Um, So which type of messages are most likely to get audiences to act? Is it the logic or is it the emotion? Well, well, that's like literally the most intense question I've ever been asked before in my entire life, Mira, but thank you. Um, no, this is, no, this is like nice. something that, you know, not only, not, you know, it's like not only are like the political communicators thinking about this, but we're all thinking about this. Even folk who are, you know, selling hotels and selling, you know, restaurants and all these things we're trying to say, like what, what moves people? We want people to be moved and compelled. Like what, are, what's going to compel them to do something. And what we've recognized you know, beyond logic, yeah, logic is a secondary, a second tier, you know, we want you, there's got to be some logic there. But the first initial, the, 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 the real kind of thing to get people going is emotion. Um, you know, you look at, I, I hate to keep referencing this. And I like told, I was doing a, a lecture, like at a college a couple of years ago. And I was like, look, at some point, I'm going to stop saying this. But I haven't because Make America Great Again has just been such a successful you know, they, they've even, they, it's even like MAGA, like MAGA itself has its own life now that is different than Make America Great Again. And and, and then, so the initial impetus in in, 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 in the president, you know, Ronald Reagan used this same slogan, you know, when he ran for president and it had a different connotation to it. But what Donald Trump was trying to get people to do is, look, America is slipping and it's slipping into the hands of people we don't want it to slip into. And we got to fight back and we got to make it great again. And so it gave people a rallying, a rallying cry, but also it gave them a, a real, in some ways, twisted, logical sense of direction. You know, they knew that whatever they had to do, it had to be in, in, in the guise of making America great again. And so that can be voting. That can be standing up for, you know, demolishing row. That can be, you know you know, putting more guns and whatever it is, they know that that's what it means. And so I say all that to say that initially you have to move people emotionally. You have to, you have to get them to be a part of it and rally around it. And then the second tier of that has to be logic. Like what do, so now that we are all here, we're in the arena, what do we do? And I, and I think that's when the, when you find the smartest messengers, you know, John Devaney, who who's down in New Orleans, who I just adore, and who's just probably one of the you know, greatest uh, marketers and messengers, communicators, you know, in, in the South, maybe in the country, he would always, you know, say that, you know, bring people here to the table and you have to give them a reason to come to the table. But then once they're at the table, you have to give them marching orders. And I think that's where the good people are when they, when they say make America great again. But then what does that mean? You go out and you pass out these flyers, you go out and you register people to vote, you go out and you vote for Donald Trump, you vote for other candidates that have that, you know, same MAGA, uh, stamp on them, and 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 it, and it becomes like something that you know creates you know change. You know, I, I use that word you know kind of you know in quotes. Um, but it, but it did. You know, it, it it gave Donald Trump a a way to create his type of change. It gave Barack Obama you know literally a way to create his type of change because he did the same exact thing with hope and change. Um, and so emotion first, logic second. Yeah, I think. You know, I just, ooh, how do I want to say this? Um, I feel like the whole MAGA messaging gave that product. that You were saying that, you know, political messaging isn't a product, but MAGA kind of became a product that people sought to buy. And you see a lot now of um, someone on social media might not 
say something supportive of Joe Biden and someone from the MAGA side will be like, yeah. Uh, and they'll be like, no, I don't mean that like you. And they're like, well, why aren't you blindly supporting him? And it's like, well, I didn't buy the product. Um, I, I still want this product to be separate or this isn't a product, it's a person entirely. But MAGA, like, you know, became a brand. It became a lifestyle brand almost. And, and so, Mira, what we're seeing now is there is a wedge between individuals who want to be MAGA stamped and those who just want to be functional, practical, good Republicans. Mm. Um, and, and we're, and we're going to drive, and, and you're going to see us over the next few months, we're going to drive that message to the ground. You know, are you, do you want to be a, a MAGA Republican or do you want to be a Republican in, in the sense of Ronald Reagan and, and other folk who were able to, you know, we, Granted, I don't agree with anything they talk about and anything they stand for. I really, I just, I just don't. So I'm going to put it out there. Uh, but, I, but you know, as, as a, as a, as a professional and, and someone who's done this business, you have to respect Mitt Romney. You have to respect Ronald Reagan. You have to respect some of these Republicans who present an agenda and then they also, you know, come with uh, policy to back it up. The MAGA Republicans don't stand for agenda, don't stand for policy. Yeah, it, it really is being part of the thing, regardless of what the thing actually does. <laughs> yeah, you can see, look, look, look at all the stuff that's happening right now with Pride Month and how all the brands and all of the, you know, everyone's like, you know, come join the, the, this was something that was difficult for a lot of brands, you know, just a decade ago. And it was difficult for even people who are not, you know, LGBTQ plus to identify with. And now you're seeing, you know, so, so many allies, so many friends, so many different people who are just celebrating pride from the perspective of the pride brand um, because they feel like they, they're included in it now. And I think, you know, corporations and companies and nonprofits, you know, decided to do that. And, and I think it's been helpful uh, for the, you know, overarching, you know, engagement of allies and, and people of LGBTQ uh, plus, um, you know, uh, you know, from that, from that space. And, and so, so yeah, so it's one emotional, but it was logical. It's like, look, you know, sell stuff and there's a beautiful product. You can buy a rainbow shirt, you know, all these things. And it just labels you, but now it doesn't just label you as gay. It's la- it labels you as someone who is a part of the movement. And I think that has been really cool. Yeah. I think, I think what you're talking about is, is when messaging transcends into identity and, um, and then that's really when it, drives people to action. So that's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah. Haima, I, I honestly really could talk to you for hours cause <laughs> this is really interesting to me, but I, I think we're going to try and wrap it up and, um, and keep it at a, at a tighter 20 minutes if that's okay. Um, and, uh, and, but thank you so much for, for joining us and thank you so much for kind of sharing what it is you do and, and your perspective on all of this. I think, um, you know, especially the way that you, you talked about pulling from emotion into action. Um, it kind of reminds me of, of how to, how we market in the marketing funnel. It's kind of the same idea. You have to get people interested and then bring them down into actually doing something and making a change, um, whatever that may be. So, um, really interesting to see how those two connect and, uh, and your perspective. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me, uh, Sam and Mira. And, and you guys know I'm a huge fan of online optimism and have been for a long time since you guys have been around. And you guys have just done such a great job. And even when, we, when I was at Great New Orleans, Inc., helping us get through uh, some of the issues we're working through uh, internally, but also companies that we're bringing into New Orleans, uh, it's very important to have you all be the, you know, the, the front door uh, to getting the product out to, to people. Well, thank you. Um, is there anywhere on social media that our listeners should find you or your work? Yeah, um, just like all the rest of the politicos in the world, I spend way too much time on, on Twitter. Uh, so you can just find me on Twitter at Haima Moore, H-Y-M-A-M-O-R-E. So at Haima Moore uh, and then Haima Moore on Instagram and, and Facebook and all the others. But I spend a lot of time on, on Twitter. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic.